So in front of you today, you have all these nice pieces of sports memorabilia. Uh, the first three actually are mine. Uh, I've got a 1969 Ron Sano jersey here, which is part of the Cooperstown collection, which Peter and Sean will tell you about. I have one of the most, one of the very original shirts that Mitchell and Ness made with Peter Capolino here. Put together this, I purchased this in 1985. This is a 1963 through 68 Ernie Banks. And um, if you don't know who this is, you cannot possibly graduate from St. Joseph's University. Okay, I got that in 1985. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff here which uh, Peter is, is going to show you. But anyway, we're pleased to welcome Peter Capolino and Sean McKinney. Uh, Peter is the one who basically took Mitchell and Ness sporting goods from his father and turned it into something completely different uh, in terms of nostalgia and throwbacks and high fashion. And Sean McKinney is a St. Joe's alum. What year were you again? 97. 97, who is CEO. Uh, and they're going to tell us the story about Mitchell and Ness. They started their presentation. Uh, and uh, you want to make this interactive? Absolutely. So ask some questions as we go along. Sure. Feel free. And uh, it's an interesting story of strategy, of sports licensing, of sports retailing and merchandising, and just, uh, you know, dealing with interesting characters. So, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Peter Capolino, and I am uh, titled the founder of the Mitchell and Estes Dow Company. Uh, the Mitchell and Estes Dow Company I created in 1988 and to reproduce all the similar jerseys what you see in front of you. But Mitchell & Ness itself is one of the oldest sporting goods companies in the United States. It began in 1904. Uh, Mr. Mitchell was a tennis man and an uh, AAU wrestler, and Mr. Ness was from Scotland, and he made golf clubs. And they got together in 1904 and formed a partnership called Mitchell & Ness, and it was located on Arch Street. And what they did was manufactured tennis rackets, and they constructed golf sticks, as we know them today, as golf clubs. And uh, I just find a little interesting story about that, because I think uh, it, it's very curious, a little piece of sports history people don't really know. Uh, in the turn of the century, the golf, there were no golf stores. There were just pro shops and pro golfers, and there were golf courses. And what happened was, every year from 1904 to about 1925, the golf pros in the whole Delaware Valley area would come to Mitchell and Ness and assemble golf clubs. So we had hickory shafts and mulberry heads and iron blades and leather grips. And the number of sets of golf clubs that they assembled was put aside, and that's how many that they could sell as teaching pros. So they'd all arrive at Mitchell and Ness in November. They'd all stop making golf clubs around March. And then from April on, they were teaching pros. And the way they made extra money was to sell the sets of golf clubs that they assemble all winter long at Mitchell and Ness. So if any of you ever come to visit or you go into the store, the new store at 1201, I think you'll see a few of the old Mitchell and Ness golf clubs there. By 1925, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Ness started getting into uniforms. They started outfitting high school and college teams. By 1933, uh, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Ness uh, outfitted the Philadelphia Eagles in their initial year, and Mitchell and Ness labels appear in Philadelphia Eagles uniforms from 1933 all the way to 1963 for a 30-year period. I was telling John Ward, when I was a high school kid and junior high in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, I would spend time reconditioning Eagles helmets and putting face masks on Tommy McDonald's helmet or Chuck Benarek or any of the other famous Eagles of that year. It was quite interesting. At the same time, Mitchell and S was making uniforms for the Philadelphia Athletics. We outfitted the Philadelphia Athletics, which became the Kansas City Athletics, and then the Oakland Athletics. We outfitted them from about 1939 to 1954, their last year in Philadelphia. We did very few things with the Phillies and the 76ers. It was mostly related to the Philadelphia Eagles, the Philadelphia Athletics were the, the two main teams that we outfitted. So growing up in the sporting goods business, uh, when I came out of college, you know, I went to Susquehanna University, and I was telling John that uh, when I was at Susquehanna, we actually played St. Joe's in basketball, and I remember losing, I think the score was like 86 to 30. It was the end of Susquehanna coming down and playing St. Joe's in basketball. <laughs> I think Jimmy Lyon might have been a 
on that team. Anyway, Michelin S had a strong roots in athletic uniforms. After I got out of college, my dad got ill. I came to work at Michelin S. My father died in 1978. I was running the company. And Michelin S was a small mom and pop sporting goods store servicing high schools and colleges all around, around the East. By 1983, Mitchell and S was not doing very well. We had moved over to uh, 1229 Walnut Street, and we were a very small operation. The world of Foot Locker and Champs and Athletes Foots and larger chains was dominating the landscape. And then another thing was happening in the world of sports. Uh, Nike and Adidas and Puma, uh, Russell, all these corporations were giving away uniforms to prominent high school and college programs and therefore taking our business away because we were selling uniforms. So the landscape of the sports marketing was changing rapidly in the early 80s. Uh, I didn't know what to really do. I was sort of at a loss how to grow the business. But I had a lot of uniform knowledge, and what happened was a man came into the store sometime in 1984, 85, and he brought a St. Louis Browns jersey. Now the St. Louis Browns are the team that is now the Baltimore Orioles. And he wanted me to repair it. It was an original jersey. A local manufacturer that I knew of uh, called Maple Manufacturing said that they could repair it. And I was over there watching them. And I came across 12,000 yards of wool flannel. And I said, what's this all doing here? And he said, well, after 1970, when double mints, polyester double mints, came into existence, wool flannel became immediately obsolete. Pittsburgh Pirates came out in June of 1970 in the first double mint uniforms in their new Three River Stadium. So I said, well, why, don't we, why don't we take some of those cool flannel, and I know how to make uniforms, let's make some vintage Major League uniforms with my favorite players. And he thought I was crazy. So I went there, I used the 12,000 yards from in 1984 and 1985, used it all up, and I just started making my favorite players. It was mostly Philadelphia Phillies and Philadelphia Athletics, a lot of Richie Ashburn and Robin Roberts, but there was also a lot of Navy pinstripes, so I started making Mickey Mantle. And then I started going back further and making Babe Ruth, and I started making the Cubs. And John must have discovered us early in late 1985, and he he came to the store and he bought one of these these Cub shirts. This is from 1966, 67, 68. Well. I had discovered a niche that no one had paid any attention to. Sports Illustrated in 1987 did a story, and that is the that was the beginning of the end of the beginning. Because as soon as Sports Illustrated did a story on the Mitchell and S, and I had created about all baseball, we were sued promptly by Major League Baseball because I was using the Yankee logo, the Brooklyn Dodgers logo, the Giants logo, the Phillies logo. So Major League Baseball sued me to put me out of business after Sports Illustrated in their July issue. Uh, they had seen this. So they called Is that like going from the, from the ecstasy to the agony? Yes. Oh, yeah, I, thought like, I, was, I thought I was going to be put out of business. So they, they, brought me up to, they brought me up to New York, and they wanted to see all the work I had done. And I had gotten a few letters of reference from some prominent business people that said I wasn't a, a counterfeiter or trying to do anything uh, illegal. John Bidswanger actually was the, uh, the, the man who was my supporter, and Peter Uberoff was the commissioner of baseball at that time. When I got up there, I brought everything. I showed them a hundred different vintage uniforms. They couldn't believe it when they saw this. And they said, okay, we'll make you the offer you can't refuse. You go into business for us or you go out of business. So I got a license in 1987, 1988 actually. I had to pay back royalties because there's royalties involved. I remember having to record all of the sales I had done from 84 through 87, paid back royalties, and I went into business officially in September of 1988 as the Mitchell & S. Nostalgia Company. Now, from 1988 until 1999, all I did was baseball. Uh, I'll just quickly show you a little, a little timeline of some of the old baseball shirts. Now, the flannel, was all gone, so I had to source flannel and find places to make it in the U.S. and in Mexico, uh, which we were able to do. So you saw John's original flannel. This piece of flannel was actually from the 60s, so this is a very, very rare shirt. When we ran out of that, 
we started making flannel, and this is made, this flannel was made in Portland, Oregon by a company called Pendleton. You may have heard of Pendleton. They do a lot of cross branding now with a lot of uh, very hip labels. This is a, and now, what I prided myself on and what, what made the company have a main presence was attention to detail and doing the shirts historically accurate. I wasn't trying to mess around or make a fashion item at that time. So this is a 1951 Willie Mays, and the reason it's 1951 is that every team in the National League celebrated their 50th anniversary, or 75th anniversary, and wore this patch on their left sleeve. So when I make a rookie Willie Mays shirt, it's got to have this patch on the left sleeve or it's not his rookie jersey. Also, the style of number is accurate to the period that he wore, and Willie actually autographed this one for me. He's also very difficult to deal with, but a very smart man. Very smart guy. This is a Hank Aaron. We got into the double knit era, decided that we had to do this. This is the shirt that he wore uh, when he hit his 715th home run and broke Babe Ruth's record in 1974. Extremely accurate to the period in terms of fabrication. No name on the back. Hank Aaron did not have his name on the back of his shirt, so that's the way we made it. Now, this one is a, uh, a marketing story. This is a limited edition that I made for Joe DiMaggio. It's his exact size, uh, the exact shirt he would have worn in his last year, 1951. In 1951, every team in the American League wore this patch to celebrate their 50th anniversary. The only problem was, I made a mistake. Uh, this flannel came from a mill in Italy, Italy called Scatalia, and it had too much what we would call uh, fabric softener in it. So when Joe autographed the jersey, the fabric softener caught the blue ink and the and the, all the ink ran. So I call this my Shroud of Turin shirt. It's got the, it's got the, and uh, there was a, a large lawsuit, and sometime when we have a little more time, uh, I can tell you more about what happened with these. But that's a, it's an interesting, interesting jersey. This is 1916. This is the first pinstripe the Yankees ever wore, and it was red, white, and blue. And America was being very patriotic, although we didn't get into the World War I until the end of 1917, 1918. In 1916, they were very patriotic. And the Brooklyn Dodgers also wore a uniform that had these colors in it. You can see this collar, and you can see the long sleeve. And this is how the Yankees began their pinstripe. Now, in 1999, I got a license for football. The NFL wanted me to reproduce uh, their history. And then in 2000, oh, I'm sorry, 1999 was first was NBA, then it was the NFL, and then it was the NHL. And the only thing, I, I love the Sixers so much, I brought one of these recreation Sixer jackets, and this is an exact duplicate, and it has the year in it, 1965 to 66. And this is what the Sixers wore as their warm-up jacket in that period of time. It's a cool coat. And I did quite a few different ones. I was going to bring the Celtics, but I hate the Celtics so much, I didn't want to even show it to you. So I like the Sixers. So by 2000, the business had, had evolved into all of these authentic jerseys. 90% of the business we did was in authentic jerseys and in authentic jackets. In 2000, a guy named Big Boy from Outcast started buying jerseys from me, and he loved the Nolan Ryan uh, uh, Houston Astros rainbow jersey. When Big Boy started buying jerseys, then Andre, his partner, started buying jerseys, and then it exploded to a media thing in which every rapper that you could think of, you know, 2002, 2000 to 2003, were wearing our jerseys on BET, MTV, Soul Train Awards, uh, American Music Awards, and John was, uh, we were talking about last time I was here in 2004 or 2005, I got a call from Sean Combs while we were right in the middle of talking to the students. Uh, I have a hip hop name, <laughs> which is, which is kind of humorous, you know, I'm like the most unhip hop person you're ever going to meet. But uh, Sean Combs, when he was Sean Puffy Combs, he named me Pete Chatty. Then when he went to P. Diddy, he, <laughs> he named me P. City. And then a group in London, the P. Diddy, sued Combs because they were called the P. Diddy, so he had to shorten his name to Diddy 
He had to get rid of the P. So he called me, and I said, what do I call myself? He said, you just call yourself City. I'll be Diddy. <laughs> so I have a shirt and hip up name of City. <laughs> now, this business went from a fan business to a fashion business like a flash before my eyes. And uh, I really wasn't prepared for it to grow as quickly as it did. And when it grew this fast, we went from very, very small numbers to a mid to medium sized national company overnight. What was happening though is that this was being turned into fashion. And I realized I needed some help for Mitchell and Ness to continue to grow and to continue to be a vibrant part of the athletic and athletic fashion community. And one of the most important things I ever did was hire this man, uh, um, Sean McKinney, to run the company. Now, although I'm 66 and you're uh, 35, he has many, many more years of experience than me in lo running larger businesses. Sean comes from and one. He understood national distribution. He understood national sales. He understood marketing. And he was a perfect, perfect person to take over the company so I'm going to leave it to Sean now, and uh, Sean will tell you where Mitchell Ness has gone and what he's doing. Okay, before before Sean starts, I just want to, I was going to jump in and, and earlier, but uh, I thought one of the things that was kind of interesting is talking about how you were able to, at the early stages, before you got involved with Major League Baseball, make jerseys that were accurate. And I remember you telling the story about a magazine collection that was upstairs from the store. Yes. And it had a whole bunch of old sport magazines. Largest collection in the world. Uh, it was a Read More Books. Had a, uh, I, we moved in to 1229 Walnut Street on the first floor, and I didn't realize, and this was fate, that on the second and third floor, uh, there was 1,800,000 periodicals. And of that, about 250,000 were sports periodicals. And I, I used those periodicals as uh, my graphic visualization of how to get the jerseys correct. It, was very, it really was the, the star of the world I'd like for this to happen. So Peter was, you know, being somewhat modest during uh, his talk. I mean, realistically, Mitchell and Ness really changed the sporting goods industry. Um, you guys have probably all heard the term throwback jersey. That never existed prior to Mitchell and Ness and Peter. So literally in the 1980s, when, when Peter got that call from Major League Baseball and Signed that first license. That's when the Cooperstown collection was started. Prior to then, nobody had ever thought of that before. So, you know, I, I got a great job. I'm a very lucky guy. Um, but, you know, I've got a company that's been around since 1904. A great, great brand. Um, so, what I'll talk, take you guys through is kind of how the business has changed over the years, who we are today as a brand. Um, and, you know, again, you know, as Dr. Lewis said, it's very interactive. So, you know, if you guys have questions, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting right where you guys are. Graduated in '97. Um, sat there. I mean, kind of knew. I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an athlete, but I knew pretty pretty soon once my baseball career started in college that that wasn't going to happen. So the question was, how do I continue with sports? And um, and here I am today. So you know, one of my goals today is, you know, if anybody out there, you know, is looking to have a career in sports, um, and you, you don't really know how to, what to make of the industry because it's a very diverse kind of fractured industry. You know, you can work in colleges and teams, you can work in the sporting goods business, uh, you can go work for the leagues, you can work for retailers. So there's a lot of different opportunities, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions and so can Peter as we're going through this and at the end, you know, if anybody has any, um, any questions or anything like that, and that's part of why we're here today. Um, but the first thing, uh, I guess the first thing I have is a question for everybody, and that's more, before today, how many people in here knew who Mitchell Ness was? And if you would do me a favor and just, you can just kind of shout out, but if you had to kind of describe, you know, Mitchell and Ness, when you hear that name, what is, what, what's, what's the description of Mitchell and Ness? Who is Mitchell and Ness? In one, one word, if you guys can yell it out. Throwback. Throwback? Yeah. What else? Authentic. Authentic? Yep. Retro. Retro. Anything else? Okay. So that's, Everything you guys just said is our heritage. You know, that's what Mitchell and S has been from 1904 <coughs> up through the 80s and 90s. Um, but honestly, if you look at some of these slides, and this is our actual website, this is our homepage, um, some of the slides that come through, 
you're going to see a lot more fashion stuff up here than you will authentic. And that was one of the big shifts that the company made. You know, as Peter talked about, you had this run up for when Diddy and Jay Z and everybody was wearing jerseys from 1999 to 2003, 2004. And then just as quickly as it, as the business skyrocketed. Um, in 2004, when Jay Z, you know, rapped one of his songs, he's putting his uh, throwbacks uh, away and wearing his button ups. I mean, that really started to change. One of the things that started to change the industry. But in this business, in the sports business, I mean, trends come and go. I mean, I saw somebody was wearing a starter satin jacket, right? So when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, starter was it. I mean, you know, and today, what's come back today, right now, probably starting around 2009, and what's really, really hot right now, is satin jackets. You know, starter-ish type satin jackets from the 80s and 90s. One of the slides that you'll see on here right here, um, a lot of these caps are snapbacks. Um, we got a snapback on right there? Yes. So snapbacks, you know, is something, again, I wore in the 80s and 90s. We brought back about three years ago with, uh, anybody watch Entourage? So a lot of the stores that you'll see in Entourage out in L.A., um, Undefeated and Supreme, Flight Club and Hall of Fame and all these cool street <coughs> stores, uh, about three years ago we started bringing snapbacks back to L.A., uh, New York City, and Japan. Just a really couple cool trend-setting shops. Three years later, we are making right now about 200 to 250,000 units per month right now at our factory. And that's only because we can't make double that because the factory's out of capacity. So, you know, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but, um, you know, this business, Mitchell and Ness, we've got the great advantage, but also the tough job of having an authentic, um, you know, very 100% historically, historically accurate part of the business that, you know, that customer today might be a collector might be a true fan. Um, and then you have the other part of the business, which is somebody wants to just rock a snapback or a fitted <coughs> or a fashion tee from a boutique or Nordstrom or Bloomingdale's to a starter satin jacket. So we've got really two separate companies under our umbrella. Um, and, and the first way that that started, when I joined the company, Mitchell and Ness was about probably 90% of Jersey company then. And that was as recently as 2004, 2005. So one of the first things that I did was, you know, kind of looking at the market and saying, okay, as a business, I don't care what business you're in, if you have one product, one item, and that item takes a dip from a trend or anything else, you're in trouble. So the first thing I did was went back to the leads and started asking for more product rights. Um, and that included t-shirts and fleece and outerwear and headwear. And today, you know, if you look at across all four leads, uh, we own rights in men's and women's for basically every product category you can imagine. And that 90% of the jersey business today is probably closer to about 20 to 25% of our business. Now, the actual revenue didn't decline. It actually went up. It's just that our total business, our total sales, total top line is grown. As far as the jerseys are concerned, are you still doing just the throwback? That's it, for the five-year period? Yeah, so, so good question. I mean, the, the, you know, what qualifies as a throwback? So the, the first thing that's happened is we've gotten requests from customers and requests from retailers and from the leads and say, would you guys want to make you know, replica jerseys? And if we were desperate for the revenue, I think we'd consider it. But this is where you really got to go back to who you are as a brand. You, know, you all have your favorite brands out there, whether it's Nike or Adidas or on the fashion side, but we know who we are as, it, we know who we are as a brand. If we were to all of a sudden make an $80 or $100 replica jersey, it, the concern is it could devalue the brand. So what you see, as Peter described, is 100% historically accurate. To the point where, Peter, you want to tell the story about the Yankees buttons, the six buttons, and going to, uh, having to go to, he just had to go testify at court many times for people who tried to scuff up the Mitchell and Ness Yankees jersey and pass it off as a game-worn jersey. They'll even put them in microwaves to age the wool and make them look like they're old. So uh, I would have to testify in court that it was one of my replica jerseys. So I made uh, some mistakes on purpose that wouldn't be significant to, to the consumer. Whereas uh, most of these Yankee jerseys, and a lot of them are five button jerseys, the real ones in the collector's market are six, seven, or eight buttons. The real jersey, like that Joe DiMaggio jersey from 1951, it's probably, the real one is probably worth in the vicinity of seven, five to $100,000. There's a Mickey Mantle jersey uh, that a friend of mine, Tony Toki, owns that is going to go up for sale for close to $400,000. Uh, so the, the real jersey, there's a, there's a great motivation to turn
turn these into real jerseys to unsuspecting uh, collectors. So we do make uh, we make some errors on purpose. And there, there are websites out there that are dedicated to finding what's wrong with Mitchell Mr. Uh, which you know <laughs> sucks in a lot of ways, but you know it also keeps us you know keeps us honest because I mean it's uh, I mean honestly it could be the, the, the smallest you know your 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 uh, piping or you know ribbing on something could be off by like you know a centimeter and they'll call you out on it. And, and part of it is I mean what they're buying what they feel like they're buying is a piece of history. We always say we're not just selling products. You know we truly are telling the history of sports and, and trying to educate you know the public through our products. We always try to tell a story you know around, <coughs> our, around our product. But um, so the Jersey side of the business today is about 25% of our business. Um, it's completely changed from where it was back in the 99 not everybody's wearing them. You know, you guys are probably, how old is everybody here? 18, 19, 20? 21, 21, 22. Um, actually, you guys, I mean, so, do you guys remember the throwback jersey trend when you were younger? Yeah? Um, I mean, everybody was wearing, I would wear like a 3X. The guy's 5'11", and he was wearing a 3X. Um, and everybody was just wearing them that way. And today, you know, it definitely has shifted back to more of the true jersey customer. What our job was as a, you know, some of the words you guys used to describe us were our heritage side. I think what a lot of people would describe us though is, you know, high fashion, uh, very, you know, on trend. Um, if you go shopping in Georgia Bloomingdale's and you see $40, you know, vintage t-shirts, you'll see Mitchell Ness t-shirts there. Um, if you go into some of the coolest streetwear stores in the cities around the world, um, you'll see cool Mitchell Ness product in there. And that was how we had to reposition the company. Kind of take what, how people viewed us and take the heritage and transition it into the fashion. Um, which, you know, again, it's, it's, it's what I think really our business has tripled in the last three years. Um, so things are working, uh, but it also kind of alleviates the concern to have to devalue the heritage side of the business. Sean, what, uh, just approximate breakdown, what percentage of your sales come through your website, through the store downtown, and through other retailers for, your, for which you're distributing? Yeah, our, our primary business is as a wholesaler. So no different than Nike, Adidas, Reebok, anybody else out there. We sell to retailers around the world. Uh, we sell to about 700 retailers, and that's about, from a revenue standpoint, it makes up about 80% of our business. So that's the primary business. And how that works, I mean, it's, it's a tough business because, you know, right now it's it's March. Do you guys know what our factory is making product for right now? What time period? If you had to guess, like, what's that cycle look like? Anybody know? We're making, we're making basically product right now from September through November. So that's, we've already gone out, sold all the product to all of our retailers around the world, took all those orders, and they're actually at the factory today getting made. And it, you have to do it that way from production you know, standpoint and having the store in time. But you guys know what's going on with the NFL right now, right? We knew as we're out there taking orders, potentially there's gonna be a lockout. So there's very real stuff you guys read every single day that you wouldn't know how it affects a company like ours, but we're sitting there you know, nervous you know, back in our office, worried about not only an NFL lockout, but there's a very, very high, very, very likely chance at this point there will be an NBA lockout. Um, so you look at the two biggest, two of our biggest leagues probably represent 60% of our business that if there's a lockout, we will be impacted by that. Um, and so those are the kind of real life kind of things that you guys hear about and see about that that we, you know, you know affect our business every single day. Um, so, you know, the Jersey side of the business, the authentic side of the business is 100% historically accurate, and then the fashion side of the business. Um, most of that fashion side is through our wholesale distribution. Most of our Jersey business is done through our flagship store in Philadelphia. So if you guys have not been there, I encourage you to come down. We just, um, we just launched a new store in November. Uh, it was at 1201 Chestnut Street between Market and Chestnut is on 12th, so right next to the Lowe's Hotel. But again, it's not just through my, it's not a sporting good store. You're not going to walk in there and just see product. You're going to go in there and really see history. You're, you're, you're going to feel like it's a Hall of Fame. Like you see. Has anybody been in there? Yeah? Cool. Um, so, you know, definitely take, take some time to get down there if you can. Um, I think you'll really appreciate what you see. And that's probably about, about 5% of our business. And then the rest of it, about 15% of our business, comes through our own website. Um, and, and this, again, you look at how business has changed. When I was in school, there was no Facebook. You know, there was no Twitter. You know, there wasn't such a thing as social media. And so even when I first started at Mitchell Ness, all that stuff was really, really, you know, relatively new. And today, our entire business model uh, has really changed. We do very little traditional marketing at this point. Um, you know, we, we do very few print ads. We do no TV. Uh, we do very little.
digital radio. But what we do a lot of is Facebook, blog, Twitter. Um, you know, so I mean that's the stuff that you guys know. I mean you're living in it today. I mean, that's the stuff that really drives information. Um, and that's as a brand, that's what you con that's what you constantly have to react to is how consumers are shopping. Any questions for anybody so far? Anything that anybody? Yeah. We are so. Yep. So in the secret. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we were acquired in November of 2007. So I'll take you through the, the, the real quick kind of how everything went down. You know, as Peter brought me on board, you know, we had these huge growth plans. We, we needed more capital. Every business needs capital to operate and to grow and to fuel growth. Um, it's early 2007. You know, we went out to raise money for about six months, um, and we had a number of different offers on the table. We were not trying to sell the company; we were just trying to raise some money and, you know, maintain about sixty percent of the business, but give up about forty percent in order to, you know, get some cash flow and really fuel our growth. Because we really believed, and we really felt like this new plan was really going to turn the company in a new direction, um, and it has. Unfortunately, um, the way licensing works. We are licensed by Major League Baseball directly through Major League Baseball. I have a license in my office about this thick that tells us what we can make, where we can sell it, what the price range has to be, every single detail possible. Same thing for NBA, same thing for NHL. But in NFL, back in 2002, Reebok went to the NFL and did a deal first of its kind. They went to the NFL and said, we'll guarantee you a 10-year deal for $250 million guaranteed. 250 million total, 25 million per year guaranteed. The NFL signed up for it, which basically, in essence, kicked Nike out, it kicked Adidas out, it kicked Mitchell and Ness out. Every licensee was kicked out, and Reebok basically owned the league merchandising rights. What that meant was that Peter then had, if he wanted to make an NFL product, he had to go become a licensee of Reebok. So from 2003 or so up until 2007, Mitchell and Ness was a licensee of Reebok. So if we made an Eagles product, our royalties got paid to Reebok. Our approvals got sent to Reebok. Um, we were not a direct licensee of the league. Well, some genius in the law, uh, law office up in Reebok's office put a one clause in that contract that said, if Mitchell and S is ever to be sold in part or in whole, Reebok has a right of first refusal. So as we raised money, Reebok had a right of first, right of first refusal in the business. Um, I met with the, uh, Peter and I met with the president up there and uh, Surprisingly, you know, they, they wanted to exercise that right. I thought that we were too small of a business at that time. Um, but if you look at it from their perspective, does anybody know who owns Reebok? No? Adidas owns Reebok. Does anybody know, how about, does anybody know who owns Converse? Nike. Anybody know who owns Hurley? Nike. So from, there's a lot of businesses out there today that the general public doesn't even know who owns who. And that's on purpose. We do not broadcast at all that Adidas owns us because there's no benefit to it. So Adidas bought Reebok in 2004, and if you look at the sports license business today, the NFL, major NFL, NBA, NHL, and college is dominated by Adidas and Reebok. And so they looked at Mitchell and Ness and said, "We don't have a high-end brand. If you had a pyramid, you know, they have Reebok on the bottom tier that sells a lot of stuff, but they're in mass." <laughs> they have Adidas, which has you know originals, and they have Y3, and they have some pretty cool stuff that's you know in a mid level. They really didn't have anything at a high level, and that's why they bought Mitchell and Ness. They saw us as kind of rounding out their portfolio of licensed brands. So since November of 2007, we've been owned by the Adidas Group. We've maintained our independence in Philadelphia. So I still run the company out of Philly. I reported to the president up there, um, and we don't broadcast. And they might know why. You guys have to guess why, what would be the downside, potentially, to people knowing that we're owned by Adidas? Um, people that's, that's absolutely one reason. Yeah, for sure. Anything else? I mean, the, the main thing is, you know, I, I, one of the questions I asked you guys at the very beginning was, you know, if you would describe Mitchell Ness, who is it? You know, Mitchell Ness has always been a very heritage brand, um, a very specialty type brand. You know, a mom and pop, and there's not many of those today. And we've all, we still view ourselves that way because we are. You know, we're still based here in Philly. We don't use Adidas as factories. We don't use their designers. We have our own. We don't use their, you know, product developers, their salespeople, their marketing people, anything. 
And so our goal has always been to maintain our independence because there is a downside to brands, no different than Nike owning Converse or Hurley. Hurley is, you know, has been a very cool surfskate brand, and if people knew that they were owned by a corporation, um, that would that would hurt their branding. And so that's why we try to keep that very independent from Adidas and Reebok. Does that make sense? Um, any other questions so far? So did it really matter if Reebok bought you or if Adidas bought you, or was it just like it did. Reebok saying? It, it, it was more of a technicality on their side. The Adidas group is a huge company. I think today there's something like $12 billion. But you have Adidas group, and it's broken up into three main segments. You have the Adidas brand, which is based in Portland. You have Reebok, which is based in Boston. And then you have what's called the Sports License Division. And that is the group that holds the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL, and the NCAA licenses. So technically, the people that bought us were the Sports License Division of the Adidas group. And for what it's worth, Adidas also owns TaylorMade Golf. They own Rockport Shoes. So again, if you looked at most corporations on their websites, I think it would be very um, you know, informative to understand who owns who out there. Because as in most businesses today, it's harder and harder to be a small company and survive. Um, and that's probably one of the only advantages today of being part of a big company like Adidas. A little bit of protection. Do you feel comfortable saying how much Adidas paid for this one? Um, not a whole lot. Not enough, I should say. I should put it that way, right? Not enough. Deserve more. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I won't. I won't say. But um, you know, at that time, I'll tell you that the business went from about a forty million dollar peak in two thousand three or so down to about a ten million dollar business. Um, this year, we'll climb back up to about thirty five million dollars. So the business has has definitely turned around. But they bought it on the low end, um, for sure. They bought it on the low end. So, but they also. I mean, that was the anticipation. that plan, um, but unfortunately, you know, they had that right of first refusal, which, which, was, uh, which was tough. But, you know, it's not been the worst situation, because right after that happened, in November 2007, after we got acquired, all of 2008, pretty much for the most part of 2009, the, company, the, the country hit the recession. Nobody was lending any money, you know, the economy was in dire straits, people were left laid off left and right. If we were an independent, small little 25-person company out of Philadelphia, it would have been harder and harder at that kind of window to really survive and compete effectively. Did you uh, own any of your uh, manufacturing operations, or is it all contract manufacturing? It's all contract. We have um, we have an office in Taiwan um, where our sourcing agent works with you know factories in China, uh, Vietnam, Korea. Um, we're starting actually. Two of our people are taking a trip to Peru. If any of you guys, you know, stay in tune with kind of current events and, and everything that's going on around the world, the world, world's getting a whole lot smaller. I was in China last back in 2004, 2005, and you can see the growth then. And that's where all of our stuff was getting made. Today, we make very little in China because their prices have gone up. You know, they are becoming, you know, if not already, a world superpower in a lot, a lot of businesses, and they're getting to be more expensive. Um, whereas five years ago, you can make anything anything you wanted in China for relatively cheap. So now we're starting to shift a lot of stuff down to uh, Central America, South America, um, both from a labor cost, from a uh, cotton cost, and from a transit time you know, of the United States. We still make the wool flannel jerseys in the US. So there's very few things that are made there still made you know, in the US in the sports apparel business today. I think New Balance still has a footwear factory up in New England. Um, outside of that, there's Last time you were here, uh, it was kind of a strategic transition for Mitchell and Ness because the, uh, the, the hip hop business, the urban business had basically ended, and ended, as you said, very quickly. Um, and you at the time uh, said a couple of things. One, that you were transitioning some of the uh, manufacturing overseas because you had hit certain price points in the U.S. and you could not hit those price points in the U.S. with U.S. manufacturing. The second thing you said was that you were entertaining at the time, uh, moving into non-sports related uh, men's clothing. So, and uh, so, are you back to all sports clothing at this point in time, or are you in some fashion where that would not be, you know, something with a sports theme to it? We uh, we had for a period of time from about 2004 all the way up until until Sean came forward, uh, a Mitchell and Ness brand of clothing. There was 
warm-ups and t-shirts, uh, hoodies and sweats. There was uh, wool and wool leather sleeve jackets that, that just said Mitchell and Ness. Uh, they were still targeted to an urban retail um, uh, customer and to urban retailers around the country. We were fairly successful with that, but, but we were entering an area where there was so much competition, uh, brands like you would know of, uh, LRG, business. All of our contracts are typically three to five year deals anyway, so they always come up for renewal. 
is that we've had Major League Baseball since around 87, 88, NBA since 98, 99, and 2000, 2001. So the beauty of that is we've got a long-standing relationship with the league. Um, and I'm up there probably every month in New York right now with the leagues. And that's the relationship side of the business. So, you know, yeah, you can do everything right product-wise, but if they don't like you, they don't like who you are, they don't like working with you, they don't think you're right to represent their league, you could lose your licenses. So we're very careful about the relationship side. We also hit our numbers. So the leagues give you that big, thick contract. It tells you all the things you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, but what it also says is, this is how much sales you have to do minimum per year, and this is how much royalty you have to pay us minimum each year. If you do not hit those numbers, they can pull your license. Now, if you really hit a slide and, and they know it's not you and certain factors you know, played into that, you know, that's where the relationship side is really important, but that's how the license part of the business works. So our contracts are constantly up for renewal anyway, but absolutely, it can change in a big way. Does anybody know who's taking over the NFL next year? Nike is. So a bidding process happened, and it's called an RFP, a request for proposal, and Reebok was in that mix, um, Nike was in that mix, Under Armour was in that mix, and I think VF Corporation, if you guys aren't familiar with them, but VF owns North Face, they own Wrangler, they own Vans, they also own Majestic. Majestic is all the on-field, you have a Majestic hoodie on right there, so Majestic owns the MLB merchandising, right? So I think Majestic is lost. Kevin Viac was coming in to speak. Oh, is he? Okay, cool. Um, so all everybody bid, and the NFL about maybe a month ago, half ago, two months ago now, just awarded Nike a new five-year deal. So that means as of as of end of February, there will be no more Reebok product manufacturing in the NFL. Nike now got in there. So that's not great for us um, because we're owned by Adidas. So if you look at it, this is where being owned by a major corporation can hurt. So Nike wins the power rights and New Era won the headwear rights. So if we want to keep our NFL license, which we've been negotiating with them for probably about five, six months now with the NFL. I talked to them yesterday. I'm very optimistic that we're going to get a piece, but it may not be as big as what we have. So that definitely plays a role.
But today, I mean, you know, Peter, you know, talked a little bit about 1904 when he started the Gotham Tennis Company. Then you were really an, an East Coast sporting goods company. Then you become a ski business. Um, you outfit the 1980 Olympic field hockey team. Field hockey. Right. Um, you know, it is, this company has been involved in every, literally every sport at every level of competition over 107 years. And so today, we're probably as diverse as we've ever been um, from a wholesale retail e-commerce standpoint. We're distributed in Asia and Europe and Canada. Um, and, you know, business is good right now, so you know, make sure you get out there and start buying some Solis products. But, I mean, I mean, we've got a couple more minutes. I mean, I, you know, I'd love to answer any, any other questions. Any questions? I have one. Um, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, go, go. Uh, just to just actually go back to the Yankees thing. So, I guess last year they wore a sign runner and a Bob Shepard patch. So, so are you five years from then? So you think you're doing something that, that no, we for have. five years before, it, where you can replicate that exact uniform? It's interesting. I think we try to key in on you know what the real market is, and we've seen a huge increase recently. Like we sold out 1986 Mets. You know we're selling a ton of Chicago Bulls stuff right now. We're the only company in the world that can make Michael Jordan jerseys. So we did a deal with Nike back in 2006 when we were still independent. We signed a three-year deal with Nike, and we're the only company in the world who can make those jerseys because we were a small little company based in Philadelphia. We weren't a threat to them. As soon as we got bought by Adidas, the next call we got was from Nike, terminating our license. That was 2007. You know, maintaining the good relationships. About a year later, we got the deal back. So, you know, we're the only you know the only ones can can make, can make those. But um, yeah, I mean, we you know we, we constantly try to look for things that you know that resonate with. Who has a disposable income today? And it seems to be that you know, 80s, early 90s, starter, Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, snapbacks, you know, that's that's really the, the target audience today. And so making something that's five or ten years old, think a 2001 piece, you know, we don't really do much with. So there's a lot of teams that we don't do anything for because they only came to the league maybe 10 or 15 years ago. That's too new for us. What else? Any, any other questions from anybody? Just that question on your distribution. You mentioned, I think, 7,000 stores you're in these days. How does that tie in with your parent company, Adidas and Reebok? Do you use their totally separate? Do you have to wrap in your own distribution deals, not driven by Reebok? Yeah, so and the only thing, so I, I, I say everything on the front end side, from the time we design a product to develop it, to getting it sourced overseas, to making it, to selling it, marketing it. All of that is done by us completely. We can beat with that. So when you go to a retailer, um, and we don't really sell to the Foot Lockers or the Dick Sporting Goods of the world, but you know if you went to kind of a regional sports specialty store, Adidas is trying to get their product in there, Reebok trying to get their product in there, and so is Mitchell and Ness. So we literally compete. So we stay completely on the front end separate. Only thing we combined on the back end was a warehouse. We shut down our warehouse here in Philadelphia three years ago, and we used one of their facilities in Indianapolis. So along with that came IT systems and accounting, but that's just all the back end. But what Sean's not telling you Travel he does, and how many sales rep organizations he hired and fired to get the right sales reps groups to represent us. It's a big part of his time and travel, and he puts it all together. So when we're selling to all these stores and sales reps all over the country, he's filtered them out and created a sales rep organization. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think most, most importantly, again, we're, we're, we're a brand, not a product, and so you want everybody to represent that brand in the right way from everybody who's, who's selling the product to where it's being sold. Those are the really, really important decisions. So you want to have a corporate sales force for Mitchell and Ness? Do you I, manufacture the reps? I have a couple of different people, more of a sales management team, and then we have independent sales reps. We have a showroom in New York City, a showroom in Chicago, a showroom in downtown LA, and a showroom in Dallas. And then I have a distributor in London that handles Europe, um, and a distributor in Canada. Do you ever, I mean, with your fashion merchandise, do you ever consider, like, or have you done this, like, give away gift bags at, at big events? Sure. Yeah, we do. Um, the ESPYs. Um, you know, now it's called gifting suites at a lot of these events, so it's the Oscars, the ESPYs, um, Grammys, you know. The, the, the rich people that can afford everything walk into a room and they get to pick out whatever they want for free. Basically, that works. So, I mean, we, yeah, we, we do some of country great. You know, it, it's funny though, I, I'll just wrap up with this, but I mean, we do some of those things, but, you know, we've been very fortunate ever since the, the you know, the whole hip hop era, we still, we've never lost the respect of any celebrity. I mean, in the last week alone, we've had, in the last two weeks, we've had Kevin Durant, who's a good buddy, come in, Spike Lee, Dropkick Murphys, uh, uh, Naughty by Nature. I mean, 
the widest range of athletes, musicians that come in, whenever they're in Philly, you know, people come in. Um, and today, the only beauty is that it may not be a jersey, it might be a hat, a jacket, a t-shirt, so they have just lots more to choose from. We don't, pay, we don't spend one dollar on an endorsement. So we have an A-list clientele that buys their stuff from us, which is an incredible position to be in. As a visual medicine nurse, I thought about like diving into the high school market, like I can use uh, like uh, Kobe Bryant's high school in Or yeah. is it just not enough with the name? Well, if, if we, we don't make any performance product. You know, I think there's a huge market right now. I think Under Armour probably has done a better job than anybody of really getting after that market. But they, you know, I think to be in the high school market, you really have to be on court, regardless of the sport. And that's why they spend they spend a ton of money on what's defined as sports marketing. So if any of you guys want to go into sports marketing, I mean, that's really, from a branding perspective, um, that's what all those big corporations pay to do. They want to be seen on court. They want their logo seen. They want it worn. No different than St. Joe's, you know, Phil has a Nike deal. Um, you know, that's Nike spending money because they understand the significance of being seen on court. Um, we don't really play there. Any other questions, anybody? Is it informative? Boring? Absolutely. Okay. One last question to wrap things up. Uh, do your do your licensing percent the percentage royalties? Uh, is there do they differ from league to league? Absolutely. They differ from product to product. Okay. So the NFL is the worst. Um, That's those, a are the, those are the most powerful league. I mean. It's funny, it's not, a lot of it's common sense. If you guys know from your own perspective, like what's the biggest league, what are the most powerful leagues, and you can be sure that they push their leverage on this. So the NFL royalties are huge. Um, NHL and Major League Baseball are typically somewhere between 10 and 12%. The NFL is closer to 18 to 20%. But all these players that you see, we have to have deals with them as well. So in addition to having royalties with leagues, Willie Mays or Ron Santo or Ernie Banks or Joe DiMaggio of the State or anybody else. They have individual agreements with all of those. I, I can't tell you how many licensing agreements we probably have if you add up players and leagues. It's in the hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. Uh, since you're not doing current stuff, do you have to have a license with, let's say, the NFL Players Association as well? Yeah, we work with the, the NHL. The only league doesn't have an um, entire player association, so we sign each of those guys individually. Um, and actually, baseball, we do the same. NFL and NBA have a retired player association. And that's one of the big sticking points in an NFL deal, and that's one of the sticking points. I think the outcome will be that the retired guys will no longer rely on the NFL to get anymore. Sort of trying to form their own group um, to get their own, you know, better pensions, better health insurance, and better um, royalty rights. Okay. Thank you very much.
We used to have a territorial draft in the NBA back in the day. And you drafted players who came from your area. So that's how the Warriors got that. That's how the Warriors got the championship. Good luck to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, I'll carry this. This is yours. Uh, Detroiter? I didn't know that.